But uh, let's go into uh, John chapter 20, and let's stand as we give reverence to uh, our reading this morning as we begin with verse number 11. And uh, we're going to read the entire uh, portion of this chapter, so it, it's going to take us about five minutes to get through this. So if you're not able to stand, well, then you can remain seated. Verse number 11, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping as she wept, she stooped down, she looked into the sepulchre, and seeth two angels in white sitting, one at the hand and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had laid, or parted at the head. I'm sorry, thank you for laughing. <laughs> Verse number 13, and they say unto her, the angels that is, woman, and by the way, that's an effectual term, there's nothing disrespectful there, Woman, why weepest thou? And she saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. So when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and she saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener, she saith unto him, sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary, and then she turned herself, and saith unto him, or Babonia, which means master, Jesus saith unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father, and I like this, <clears throat> and your father, and to my God, and your God. Now Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples and that had seen the Lord, and that had been, that he had spoken these things unto her. So then that same day at evening, being the first day of the week still, uh, I've been put in there by yours truly. When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said, he had showed unto them his hands, his side, and then were the disciples glad. And then they saw, when they saw the Lord and Notice then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And so when he had thus, or pardon me, when he had said this, he then breathed unto them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when, the, when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands and the prints of the nails, and put my fingers into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into the side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and his disciples were within, excuse me, and Thomas saith unto them, then there were Thomas with them, excuse me, and when Jesus came, stood at the door being shut, he stood in the midst and saith, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy fingers. Hey, Jesus, he evidently, he was there by spirit. He heard what Thomas was saying a week earlier. And behold thy hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust and it into my side, and be not faithless, but be believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord, my God. I don't know that Thomas did that. I don't know that he did take his hand and reach into his side. Now, I don't think he took his fingers and put it into the prints of the nails, he just simply fell on his knees and said, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. And many other signs truly did Jesus 
in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Father, bless the reading of your scripture. Help me to take uh, uh, what I've studied and give me that train of thought to only bring those things that you would have to be brought to life. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. And everyone say it. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We have, first of all, Mary Magdalene here meeting with Jesus here at this garden tomb, which we've already read. And, and she's weeping, and Jesus, when he meets with her, he's asking her, why are you weeping? In Revelation 21, verse number 4 and 5, we are told that uh, when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, evidently there's going to be some weeping. I don't know why there'll be weeping. But there's going to be some weeping. It may be, the Bible says there'll be weeping for the space of 30 minutes. And then all of a sudden, there's, the tears are going to be wiped away. And, and there'll be no more crying. But perhaps uh, at that time, we're going to, the Bible says when that is wiped away, then we'll remember the former things no more. But there for a while, perhaps we're going to remember some things that we would not like to remember. But um, all tears are going to be wiped away. Notice it says in Revelation 21, And God shall wipe away, verse number 4, all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, these words are true and faithful. So the promise that we have here in verse number 5 of Revelation chapter 21, it carries the same assurance that our Lord promised. And you were saying, well, why did you read that from Revelation chapter 21? Because of what is said in John chapter 20, verse number 17, where Jesus said, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. If he's my father and my God, one day I'm going to stand before my father and my God. And the word of God has made that very clear. And I'm going to stand, and Jesus is going to stand there with us. We're not, we're, to stand before God is going to take a lot of grace because uh, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But Jesus will give us that strength to do so. And there's going to be some tears, there's going to be some crying, there's going to be some sorrow, there's going to be some shame. Uh, but those things uh, soon will be wiped away, and the tears will be dried up, and we'll enter into the glorious presence of, of the Lord, and we will be with him throughout all of eternity. And Jesus Christ came into this world to give us that kind of a standing. Without what he has provided, we would not be able to stand before God. But we stand not in our righteousness, nor do we stand in our confidence, but we stand in the confidence of the Lord and in his righteousness. For he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Bible makes it very clear, in essence, that we are somewhat, in a figurative way, hid in Christ. And one day we'll be seated with Christ in the heavenlies in a very physical way. Right now we're already there, but spiritually. And there'll be some physical tears, and those tears will be wiped away. So <clears throat> I just kind of threw that out as a way of uh, maybe a, an introductory thought, but it has nothing to do with what I want to preach to you this morning. <laughs> What I want to preach to you this morning is found in verses 19 through 23. And uh, let's look at uh, this as we kind of break it up. There are three events that are going on here that I want to kind of break down for you. Uh, first of all, Jesus identifies himself by his wounds. Uh, I said three events. I meant several events. But there are, there are three events concerning Jesus identify himself that I want to kind of bring out right now. First of all, Jesus, when he identified himself to Mary Magdalene, when he identified himself to the apostles, and then later when he identified himself uh, to Thomas, 
he identified himself by the wounds that he had received. Those are identifying marks. Usually, uh, when the, you are filling out some kind of paperwork, paper, paper, paper wall, paperwork to satisfy the law, like every year we have to get clearance, I'm what they call a brown card carrier at the uh, state prison there in uh, a place called Calipatra that's out there near Brawley in El Centro. Uh, it's a state prison and there's something like 4,000 inmates there. It's a level four prison and you have, every year we have to reapply for federal clearance and they want to know what kind of identifying marks that we have on our body. And in case we're ever apprehended by the criminals, by the inmates and held as hostage uh, and uh, we're put to death uh, at the hands of the inmates uh, uh, and they strip our clothes off and put their clothes on uh, on us and try to break out or whatever the case may be, they can properly identify us with the marks that are on our body. Uh, usually, <clears throat> that is a common thing. They want to know some identifying marks. And so, <clears throat> Jesus, when he identifies himself, he identifies him himself by the marks that man has put on his body, uh, by the pierced hands, the pierced feet, and the pierced side. So when Jesus Christ met with the apostles, he identified himself by his marks. Thomas said, well, unless I see those marks, I'll not believe. Unless I take my fingers and thrust them in the prints of his hands, and into the pierced side, I will not believe. So when Jesus shows up uh, a week later on a Sunday night when people are supposed to be in church, well, Jesus showed up and Thomas, when he saw those identifying marks, he didn't have to take his finger and thrust it into his hand or into his side. He felt simply believed. Interestingly, when we see Jesus, we're going to identify him by his marks and we're going to sing a song. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 9 through verse, well, verse number 9 and verse number 12. In fact, <clears throat> if you don't have it there in your bulletin notes, you might want to turn there. Revelation 5 verse number 9, and they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Verse number 12, as they continue singing, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. When we see Jesus, we're going to see him as a slain Lamb to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. In Isaiah 52, verse number 14, the Bible makes it very clear that when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. For we are told that his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. No, we're not going to see something beautiful. We're going to see something marred. We're going to see something scarred. We're going to see something with open wounds. We're going to see Jesus as a slain lamb that lives evermore in a glorified body, but with open wounds to remind us throughout all of eternity the price that had to be paid. There's nothing in heaven made by the hands of man but the scars and the wounds that Jesus carries throughout all of eternity. And I believe those will be the tears when we see our wounded Savior. We see his visage marred more than any man. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He was wounded and he was afflicted. And all of our stripes were laid upon him, the Bible says. We'll see those stripes, we'll see those wounds, and we'll be reminded of what it cost for our sins to be washed and for us to be redeemed so that we can stand before his Father, his God, and call him our Father and our God. 
and your sins and the sins that you're trampling over the blood of Jesus Christ to get to after this service. Well, you'll be reminded of those sins and how you were redeemed from those sins and how those sins were washed by his precious blood. And your heart will be smitten. And then after a while, the former things will be wiped away and the tears will be dried up. But we'll see him for all of eternity as a slam, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Thirdly, we see as identifying marks when he comes to earth. The Bible makes it very clear, and we shall come with him. When Jesus Christ comes to earth and his bride comes with him, he's going to sin, descend to the same place that he ascended. In Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, the Lord said, all power, all authority has been given unto me. He made it very clear, <clears throat> but you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And we are to be witnesses of him, both in Jerusalem and in, Judea, in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world. And after he had spoken the Great Commission, as we see in Matthew 28, verse number 18, 19 and 20, as we see over in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, beginning with verse number 50. As we see in John chapter 16, verse number, or Mark chapter 16, verse number 15, and John chapter 20, as we read, even as my Father sent me, so even I send you. Jesus, after he had given the Great Commission to the church, he ascended up into heaven. There were two angels standing by as they stood watching and gazing as he was caught up into the clouds and he vanished out of sight. And they were asked, why are you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, the same Jesus that you see ascending up into heaven will descend in like manner, paraphrased by yours truly. Well, when Jesus comes back to earth, he's going to come back with those same scars with those wounds. We're told over in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12 and verse number 10, and when he descends back upon planet earth, they shall look upon him, or they will look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And they shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And in chapter 13 and verse number six, one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, these are those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And as there was great mourning in heaven and as the tears were wiped away in heaven, so the tears will be wiped away here upon the earth. The Bible says that there'll be a great mourning throughout all of the land when the world recognizes the Messiah that they've been looking for. The Muslims are looking for their Messiah. The Jews are looking for their Messiah. The Christians are looking for their Messiah. When the world realizes the Messiah is Jesus, the one that was crucified, the one that was pierced through with many sorrows, pierced through with rusty nails, the one whose side was open. And we will see Jesus not only in heaven, but here upon this earth as a lamb slain. And so he will be identified by those wounds. Identified by those wounds to remind us not only in heaven, but here upon the earth, the price that had to be paid for man's sins to be redeemed. As we read on in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, we, we come to the great commission that the Lord gave. Jesus commissions them to go into the world. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Jesus Christ sent us into the, all the world with great authority. All power, he said in Matthew chapter 
28, verse number 18, is given unto me. And so he said unto us, go ye therefore. In other words, we have now the authority. The authority to do what? To go into all the world and proclaim the message of God's word. We do that by power of the Holy Ghost. What's interesting here is Jesus breathed onto them. He breathed upon them the Holy Ghost. He said, as he breathed upon them, to receive my spirit. Now, that needs some clarification because uh, <clears throat> there are some, and I've heard preachers preach, uh, that the apostles were already filled with the Holy Ghost before the day of Pentecost because the Holy Spirit was breathed upon them. But that's not what is going on. If you'll read the text clearly, it says, As My Father has sent me, even so send I you. If you read that carefully, that's prophetically, that is in present tense mode in reference to something that is about to come. He's in reference to Pentecost. Now, a proof text to back up what I'm about to say here is found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verse number 49. Where he says, Behold, I sin. Now, the word sin is present tense there as well, and it's prophetic. The promise of my Father unto you. Now, what was the promise? Well, when we get in Acts chapter 1, verse number 5, we're told the promise was the receiving of the Holy Ghost and the power that goes with it. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, goes back to the great commission that was given in Matthew 28, verse number 18, John chapter 20, verse number 20, Mark chapter 16, verse number 15, Luke chapter 24, verse number 15. And it's prophetic and it's reaching forth to the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit power came down upon them. And all of a sudden... They were able to preach the word with power. Their understanding, their eyes were open. They understood, yes, Jesus did breathe upon them, but the fulfillment of the power did not take place until the day of Pentecost. And we know this because of what is in what we're told in verse number 42, Luke's gospel, chapter 24. I behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So Luke's gospel 24 verse number 49 is parallel to what we read over in John's gospel chapter 20 verse number 20 and 21. And they get clarification from this Gospels and the harmony of the Gospels and the synoptic Gospel of John, we have to read all of the Gospels. So we get clarification from Luke concerning what Jesus is saying. Yes, he breathed unto them the Holy Spirit, but they did not receive the power until the day of Pentecost. And that's why he told them to go and tarry in the upper room. I'm here to tell you this morning that you and I have that same power. The moment you were saved, the promise of the Holy Spirit came upon you. You have received the promise of the Holy Spirit and you are sealed with the spirit of promise until the day of redemption. And if you have received the promise of the Holy Spirit and you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption means that you have the power and the authority of Almighty God to go out into a world that is lost and headed toward a devil's hell and tell them the glorious message of Jesus Christ. And if you're not doing it, something's wrong. Either you're disobedient or you don't have the power. What's interesting here is that he gave them authority. He said, and whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. I have the authority, believe it or not, when I lead someone to the Lord to tell them based on the authority of God's word, 
friend, because you have invited Jesus into your heart, you have asked him to forgive you of your sins, based on the authority of God's word, I'm telling you that you are saved and that your sins have been removed and that you are now a child of God and Jesus is your savior and God is now your heavenly father. And if you were to die this very moment, based on the promise of God's word and the authority for which I stand upon, you are going to heaven. We have that authority. Christ has given that to us. What a tremendous power and what a tremendous privilege it is for us to go with the authority of God's word and tell lost sinners by the authority of God that you can be saved and you can be assured of heaven and we can tell them based upon the authority of God's word. If you've done this, yes, you are saved. We don't have to say, well, I, I hope you are saved. I hope the Bible's true, and I think this is true. No, if they meant it with all their heart, then we can say by the authority of God's word, your sins are remitted. Yes, they are. Amen. Amen. First John chapter one, verse number nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My little children, I write unto you that you sin not, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father who is Christ Jesus the righteous. And he is not only the propitiation of our sins, but the, or he is not only uh, blah, 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 the propitiation of our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, we know that we have the petition that we desired of him. And that petition of prayer is very clear. He says, I am not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Amen. When they pray that prayer, we can tell them based on the authority of God's word. These things God has written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. I can tell them based on the authority of God's word that if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I can say that by the authority of Paul. I can say that by the authority of Peter. I can say that by the authority of God's word. It's not a hope so salvation. It's not a think so salvation. It's not a maybe I think or maybe I wonder or whatever. No, it's a no so. You can know that you have eternal life. But it's very explicit. Thomas proclaimed Jesus as God. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs did Jesus in the presence of the disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. In 1 John chapter 5, and I know I've worn this passage out, but in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 20, we read these words. Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons need to pay attention to By the way, they might want to read their own translation from 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 20. And we know that the Son of God is come and have given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and that we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. This is the true God. Thomas fell on his knees. You said, well, it's not there in the scripture. Well, I'm sure he did. My Lord and my God. And Jesus did not say, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. I may be Lord, but I'm not God. 
No, Jesus accepted that praise. Jesus accepted that praise because that's who he is. Only God can wash away your sins. We are told in the book of Acts that we have been washed by the blood of God. We were saved by the blood of God. It's the blood of God that has cleansed us from our sins. It's God's blood, the precious blood that has washed and cleansed us. So important that we understand. Thomas did not believe. He said, except I see and I touch. Jesus said, well, there are many that have not seen and many that have not touched, but they have believed and blessed are they. There's going to be a greater reward for you than there was for Thomas. There's going to be a greater reward for us than there were the apostles because we have believed without seeing. We have believed without handling. We have believed just based on the word of God. We who go forth with the understanding that this is the message of hope and this is the message of salvation and the message of power to deliver and translate people out of darkness into the glorious light of our wonderful Savior and give them the assurance and the joy of eternal life and the hope of standing in His presence. I say unto you, there is a greater blessing that's coming to us. And for you that are... Afraid to go something wrong about that faith. When you don't see the need and you don't have the burden and you don't have the concern to go out into a lost world and tell them that there's a fiery indignation and a horrible judgment that they stand in jeopardy of for not receiving Jesus Christ, then shame on you. Amen. The Bible says if we forbear to deliver them which are drawn unto death, and if we say in our heart, behold, we knew it not, does not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, does not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? We're all going to stand before God. And the apostle Paul made it very clear in Acts chapter 20 that my hands are free from the blood of all men because I have went house to house. I have not shunned to declare everywhere to everyone the gospel of Jesus Christ. My question to you, who are we telling? Who are you telling? It's a glorious message. It's a beautiful message. It's a wonderful message. But it's a saving message. It's a powerful message. The word of God makes it very clear that we have responsibility now to go and tell. And people out there are struggling with their sins and their shameful and fearful of standing before a holy God. We can tell them that they can be assured by the authority of God's word that their sins can be remitted and they can stand before God unashamed if they'll just simply receive him as their Savior. Right. Yeah. The gospel message is the good news that Christ came into this world, he went to a cross, and he died for sinners. He was buried and bodily the third day from the grave. He arose in a glorified body, never to be put to death, and he has went into heaven and he has sent the Holy Spirit to take residence in your heart if you'll just simply open your heart and receive the message of salvation. With every head bowed.